Most of you are familiar with the M1 carbine. You've looked it over closely, you've fired it, and you found that it combines light weight with good accuracy at short ranges and plenty of firepower. But the Army has now increased this firepower to over 750 rounds per minute by developing the new carbine M2. With the exception of a lever on the left side of the M2, you'll find that both models are almost identical in appearance. This lever, called the selector, is also the key to the difference in functioning. When it's in the rear position, the M2 fires semi-automatically, like the M1. In other words, one shot each time the trigger is pulled. But when the selector is moved forward, the M2 becomes full automatic and will continue to fire as long as the trigger is held back or until all the ammunition has been fired from the magazine. To supply its high rate of fire, a new magazine has been developed for the M2. It holds 30 rounds and is interchangeable with the 15 round magazine. The rate of fire of the M2 is between 750 and 775 rounds per minute. Now let's see what the designers had to do to make the carbine fire full automatic. Several new parts were added and some parts were modified. But despite their similarity, the guns cannot be modified in the field. Remember that in semi-automatic fire, the hammer is caught by the sear and held in the cocked position. It can't go forward unless the trigger is first released and then squeezed again. The carbine, full automatic, is a device which will trip the sear even though the trigger is still depressed. It can be done by simply pushing down the front end of the sear like this, but that would instead will call on one of the new parts, the sear trip. This is the sear trip spring and plunger. They fit into a recess on the front of the trip and keep it under tension. But before we can install this sear trip on the hammer pin, we'll have to change the lower portion of the hammer to make room for it. A new hammer has been designed with the lower part cut away. Now let's put the new hammer and trip in their relative positions and install them in the model. This part of the trip is intended to contact the sear. But if we pivot the trip, we can see that they don't quite reach. A new sear will answer that problem. It's exactly like the old one, except for a raised shoulder, which fits underneath the trip. That's all that is necessary to establish the contact. With the hammer cocked and the trigger held back, the trip can now depress the sear. Right now, let's consider the new pin only as a pivot point for the lever. The rear end of the lever fits into this slot on the trip, and both are under tension of the spring. The front end, or toe of the lever, bears against a cam, which has been added to the slide. As the slide moves back, the toe of the lever is raised by the tension on the rear end. 
When the slide comes forward, the toe of the lever is cammed down. As the rear end of the lever moves up and down, the trip pivots accordingly. With the lever in place, the model functions like the M2 in full automatic fire. Now let's follow this automatic firing cycle. As the trigger is pressed and the first round fired, the slide moves to the rear, allowing the lever to pivot. The trip pivots under tension of its spring. This moves the trip clear of the sear. Until all the ammunition in the magazine is used up or until the gunner takes his finger off the trigger. Releasing the trigger will allow the sear to be pushed back over the trigger post. The sear moves back far enough to be out of reach of the trip. Now when the trip comes down, it does not contact the sear and the hammer remains in the cocked position until the trigger is pressed again. So much for the full automatic firing cycle. Let's look at the other side of the gun to see how all these new parts are controlled by the selector, which enables the gunner to switch from semi-automatic to full automatic fire, or vice versa. The selector is the part by which you tell the assembled M2 from the M1. It fits on the crank pin like the jaws of a wrench. This little notch has been cut in the receiver so we can install the spring, which holds the selector in position. The crank pin is rotated when the selector is moved back and forth. Now we'll turn the gun around to see what happens on the other side as the pin rotates. By removing the lever, we can see that it's not just an ordinary straight pin, but that a crank arm extends from it. When the selector is moved back and forth, this crank arm is lowered and raised. But when the selector is moved to the rear or semi-automatic position, the crank pin lowers the lever away from the cam. As the lever is lowered, the spring rotates the trip, raising it above the sear. Now when the slide moves to the rear, the lever and the trip remain undisturbed and the trigger mechanism functions just as though the full automatic feature had never been added. Although the firepower of the carbine has been increased to more than 750 rounds per minute, its original weight of about six pounds has only been slightly increased. It's more valuable than ever as a light and accurate shoulder weapon for the close-in type of fighting encountered in the war against the Japanese. At the present time, the Japanese army has only one automatic shoulder weapon. It's the 8mm submachine gun, Model 100. With its 30-round clip attached, it weighs nearly 10 pounds, despite its size. The Model 100 is air-cooled and blowback operated, with a rate of fire of about 1,000 per minute. But this short 10-inch barrel and a muzzle velocity of only about 1,000 feet per second limits the weapon's accuracy.